I think it's really worth remembering, and perhaps here we can splice in some clips of the way Kamala Harris has spoken about Israel, not just in the context of being Biden's VP, where you can make an argument that her hands were tied, that she was constrained as part of an administration. Maybe you can make that argument. But prior to joining the Biden ticket it, in her you know, uh, position as a senator. Good morning, APAC. Good morning. What an honor. Let me be clear about what I believe. I stand with Israel because of our shared values, which are so fundamental to the founding of both our nations. I believe the bonds between the United States and Israel are unbreakable, and we can never let anyone drive a wedge between us. Um, and the kinds of things she's been saying more recently. I just want to follow up specifically with the refugee camp. Do you think that that is a legitimate military target? That it's an acceptable. I, we are not telling Israel how it should conduct this war. And so I'm not going to speak to that. Erica. That I struggle to differentiate from the basic bipartisan line on Israel. And I think people have been kind of making the argument that Biden seems to have in a particular, even hyper exaggerated commitment to Israel and to Netanyahu in particular. Um, that perhaps dis distinguishes himself even from the bipartisan blob, which has always had this kind of Israel first strategy, so that even someone like Reagan is being raised as an example of a president who was willing to pick up the phone and deter Israel from, it's weird to call them its worst excesses because it's all its worst excess, but even its, its worst, worst, worst ex excesses, um, and that Biden wouldn't even do that. But that seems like an odd bar to say that Bi that Harris is better than Biden because Biden is a, a hyper zealot who's off the charts and um, Kamala is sort of the status quo Zionist is to say that the situation prior to October 7th in Palestine is sufficient. And I thought that we had gone through enough of an awakening over the last 10 months of deep education, the likes of which I don't know that we've ever had among kind of normie Americans about the depth of degradation and oppression that Palestinians have been living through for the last 75 years, that there wouldn't be a, re a willingness to return to the norm. But that's what it feels like. It feels like as long as you get rid of the biggest Zionist in American presidential history and go back to the status quo, people are going to find it to be sufficient. So I wondered if you could maybe speak to what you may or may not have been hearing from the Muslim American and Arab American community about the shift to Harris that may or may not sound different from what we're seeing from online leftists. It's very important to note um, that the way the Muslim American community thinks is going to be different than any other uh, community within, voting community within the United States. And I say that because um, in my own personal circle, there were people in 2020 who were staunchly for Biden because of Trump. And these were arguments I had uh, with them where I said, listen, I don't think lesser evil voting is sustainable. Really, it's not going to get us anywhere. Um, and they were staunchly for Biden. And, and, and these arguments and these uh, fights had a strain on our relationship those same people now are of the mindset of let it all just burn down, as in I've, I've had enough. Um, I don't care about empty promises, empty rhetoric, empty words. And we've all realized by extension that people who try to individualize Joe Biden as, and it may be true, the greatest Zionist president of all time are without realizing it, admitting that Donald Trump may have been the lesser evil in this in this scenario. But that's not being said out loud. Um, and we have to emphasize, look, we are very well aware of who Donald Trump is. We know who Donald Trump is. The very first person to get on television and warn about Donald Trump was a Muslim by the name of Keith Ellison, who was laughed off TV mm. when he said, I can see him leading the Republican ticket. We're not strangers to who he is. But we're also not strangers to what's been going on, even though it hasn't been covered in the mainstream news. A lot of people don't realize from January 2023 up until October 6th, 
2023. Israel had killed more Palestinians than at any time since 2006. Just because those killings are not appearing on your timeline in droves, like what we've been seeing in the last 10 months, doesn't mean they didn't happen. Those home demolitions that happened, just because they're not showing up on your timeline in droves, does not mean that that reality doesn't exist. And I think the wider public that has now breathed a sigh of relief that Kamala Harris may be the 2024 nominee, we should probably contend with the fact that underneath the guise of justice and equality, there's possibly just self-preservation and self-interest at the very bottom of it all. And I say that in the sense that many people have come up to us and said, do you know Donald Trump is worse? And we said, yes, we are very well aware that Donald Trump is worse, but it is absolutely humiliating to vote not just for the person, i.e. Joe Biden, who has caused this genocide, but to vote in favor of the party that was silent or backed him or was complicit or is right now was applauding Netanyahu in his speech. It is humiliating. And yet, you know what? For us, integrity and dignity is going to be more than self-preservation in this case. Yeah, as we're recording, I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, Netanyahu has just, you know, an hour or so ago addressed Congress, um, standing ovation. I asked the commander there, how many terrorists did you take out in Rafah? He gave me an exact number, 1,203. I asked him, how many civilians were killed? He said, Prime Minister, practically none, with the exception of a single incident where shrapnel from a bomb hit a Hamas weapons depot and unintentionally killed two dozen people? The answer is practically none. You want to know why? Because Israel got the civilians out of harm's way, something people said we could never do, but we did it. Obviously, there are incredible protests outside of the uh, event. Um, and I want to give really a lot of kudos to the people who participated in that. But honestly, watching that footage, you know, we all knew it was coming and we knew it was happening, but it chilled me even more so. It, it felt even worse than I anticipated it feeling, seeing all of these American elected standing up and applauding this man as he tells bald-faced lies uh, from the podium about the lack of civilian deaths and the precision and Ethic and ethics of the Israeli military. Um, that being said, I want to come back to something that you just mentioned, which is the kind of personal degradation that would come along with voting for someone like Biden that enabled all of this and all of the people in his cabinet and administration who enabled all of this. I That really resonates with me. And I've heard some people who previously were sort of vote Biden as a defensive strategy, vote no matter who type people, articulate that to me as they've explained why they were at post October 7th, no longer going to vote for Biden. And it's interesting because while I have been happy that they have had that shift, it has troubled me in part because I want their decision-making to have more of a logical kind of buttress to it so that it doesn't take a genocide for them to get to this point. I guess what I'm saying is, for me, while that kind of psychic harm of voting for someone who's done something so cruel to one's own community is very visceral, understandable, and it's something that I tried to communicate to Noam Chomsky on, I think, what was episode 10 of this podcast so many years ago. For me, it's that. Plus, also, I do think there's actual, actually a strategic motive for being willing to withhold your vote um, in exchange for concrete demands. And also a strategic value in withholding your vote altogether because you were going to give it in the alternative to a third party that can get federal matching funds and other kinds of um, you know, ballot access measures and the like if they get to a certain percentage of the vote, right? And I make all of these arguments in tandem because I do think it's important to be able to see what the value is of voting for someone other than the Democratic nominee, even if the global circumstances fall short of a genocide. And I'm really sort of stunned and um, 
you know, kind of heartened by the abandoned Biden project in particular, because in the grand scheme of all of the pro-Palestine efforts, which I admire and respect across the board, abandoned Biden has, seems to be unique to me and its willingness to say, I'm not going to be held hostage by the idea of a Trump victory, either in my ethical commitments or my strategic plan. And so I, I wonder if you can talk through the choice to say, yes, this is a movement that is willing to say, I, you know, I'm willing to stick the landing. I'm willing to make a credible threat that my my vote to the extent that it is even gettable at this point would be conditioned on X, Y, and Z, or else, yes, I am willing to suffer the consequences of a Trump uh, presidency and how you message around that. Certainly my audience knows how I've been messaging around that, but I'm curious about that decision-making, how people have been responding to it and how you've been, how that message has been received out in the world from your perspective. So uh, you threw a lot at me. Let me see if I can uh, organize it and, and, and put it in, in the correct context. Before October 7th, the mindset within most Muslim Americans was Zionism and pro, the pro-Israel theme of the U.S. government is not going away anytime soon, and we're just going to have to learn to live with it. Meaning, I need to vote in favor of my immediate benefit here so that I can use whatever resources I have here to help those people over there. After October 7th, that methodology, that strategy was shattered. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that many people don't know what it feels like to have your family be killed and then have the murderer and the person who gave him the arms deal be applauded by people who like to laud themselves as moral and just and slap the label of activists on themselves. It completely broke the Muslim American community mentally post October 7th. Watching Joe Biden get up on the podium and say, I never thought I would see evidence of 40 beheaded babies like I did today. And then the White House quietly retracting that statement saying, actually, he never saw evidence of 40 beheaded babies. Questions should have been asked then. Did he lie purposely, which is horrific? Or is he having some sort of cognitive decline that's not being talked about? To have his rhetoric then lead to the stabbing of a six-year-old child 26 times by the landlord, to have three young men shot in Vermont for wearing kufis, one of them is now paralyzed, to have the attempted drowning of a three-year-old in Austin, all of that goes back to the rhetoric and the actions and the behavior and the support that the man that many people voted for in 2020 as the lesser evil did. And so then now there's become a major shift. And when Abandoned Biden was formed and started, our goal was to ensure that, listen, you're not going to vote for Trump and you're not going to vote for Biden. Do not sit at home and just not vote. Stand in line at the polls and vote, even if you're just going to write Gaza down as a writer. For the love of God, don't just sit idly by and resign yourself to nothing. You have to be doing something. You have to be acting. We have to be in the streets. And so what first started off as a movement of saying we will not vote for Joe Biden has now transformed into a wider movement against not just Joe Biden, but the very mechanism of lesser evil voting. And the strategy that we're talking about is, it doesn't matter if you vote for the Democrats enthusiastically or reluctantly or in disgust, or if you vote and then you get on social media and say, I hated the fact that I have to do this. I hate the person that I voted for. It doesn't matter. A vote is a vote and it went to that party. They don't care how they got it. They don't care in any way, shape or form. Now, how do we talk to the people who said, well, I'm just going to sit at home and not vote? Um, that has been a little more tricky. But our approach has been in terms of strategy is, um, look, in business sense, there's a cost for acquiring a customer and a cost for retaining a customer. The cost for acquiring a customer is a lot more. 
So for example, if a politician is going to look at who he needs to, who they need to appeal to, the non-voters, I have to spend resources to convince them to vote. And when I do that, it's not really a guarantee that they will vote for me. They might go vote for my opponent. So I'm just going to leave that alone. The people who are standing in line to vote, I will dedicate my resources to them to say, listen, what can I do? Because you're already putting forth the effort to vote. You're standing in line at the polls, you're voting. What can I do to get you to vote for me? That's how we're trying to get the Muslim American, the Muslim American community to think about voting. We want to emphasize that we're not trying to say salvation is going to come through electoral politics. But a punch consists of a fist made up of five fingers, right? One of those fingers is going to be voting. Um, so in regards to your wider question, the strategy, that's how we've been approaching it with the Muslim American community. But on the other side is people who have just completely been eviscerated in their belief of the concept of lesser evil. To us, it's just all evil. It doesn't matter. One party is giving us crumbs and the other saying, you won't get any crumbs. And we're saying, we're not going to settle for anything less than that. What do you hope people do when they do get to the ballot box? Because, you know, I feel like I'm in a tough position sometimes. I, you know, I'm a mere, merely a lowly podcaster. I have been, over the course of the years of doing this, increasingly confident about my sort of strategic instincts, but have wanted to maintain a kind of a humble posture because the stakes of some of the arguments that I make are understandably very significant, right? And nobody, you know, there's a reluctance, I think, from any kind of vaguely humble person to have an effect that might be disastrous for various people because of a kind of um, what might be described as accelerationism. But my personal belief is that part of the benefit of third parties is to provide a landing pad of sorts so that people can vote, don't feel like the options are to vote for the lesser of two evils and so they might as well stay at home, and that their discontent with the Democratic Party isn't registered as apathy or interest in a more right-wing project, right? Because we've seen so many times Democrats say, well, we lost this election, we've got to move to the right, but instead send a clear signal that you need to move to the left and voting for a left independent party like the Green Party or an independent candidate like Cordell West or Claudia De La Cruz would give that kind of a signal. That is my perspective, not to mention all of the benefits that accrue if you do invest in a given party that can then get money and all of these other kind of things and put forward better candidates and have more resources going forward so they actually can present a real challenge um, to the duopoly. That being said, it doesn't seem like some of these movements, I'm, like, I'm thinking principally of uncommitted, have gone as far as to say your vote should go here to register our politics, to, you know, to make our claim and our desires of where we want the Democratic Party to go more clear. I remember, I think it was Cenk Uger who expressed some frustration when he was still in the race that the uncommitted vote wasn't going anywhere, wasn't going to a candidate, wasn't going to bolster a candidate who could potentially take their claims even farther than just a sort of, I don't mean to diminish it, but, but a sort of performative primary vote. And I do wonder if there have been any conversations about taking the kind of next step into more explicit endorsements or political investments and in party infrastructure, starting new alternative parties, whatever it may may be, but to give some, but, you know, to get, to get in a realm that's a little bit more concrete of not just not voting for Biden, but going to the polls anyway, but then to say, okay, who's our, who's our guy or gal? Who's our candidate? Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast. That's patreon.com slash bad faith podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.